I will tell you that most of my PC friends have gone mad. The ones who were diehard PC PC people have gone mad. The ones who used to go <laughs> everybody came near them with my PC. I'm not saying the link of Mac versus PC, but they turned into these like transformer robots. Oh, that sounds fun. Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to uh, welcome you and thank you for coming today. I know we are competing with the big drug luncheon, and I appreciate your time and attention in coming to our session on learning about universal design for learning to reach all learners. I'd like to introduce to you our guest speaker today is Ann Truger. Ann Truger is the Instructional Technology Specialist at CEDAW. For those of you who don't know what CEDAW is, I think we all do, but that's the Special Education District of Lake County. Ann taught here at Stevenson about three or four years ago, up until about that, and so those of you that have been here a while know Ann and know some of the work that she did before she left and went to CEDAW. I also want to just point out on our calendar that next month we meet March 20th. We're uh, going to be back in that 2113 room, not in here. And then we are bringing in Carol Bruce, who is a music teacher from Sunset Ridge. And she's also a recent gold Maple winner and is taking a sabbatical this semester, I think, and is going to come and do a, a workshop with us or kind of share a little bit of what she's doing with her students. She does some amazing work with her kids. She's coming in March. Our April meeting is up in the air right now. We have a TBA as far as a topic. We also might be moving the date. There's a conflict that we have on the calendar. I have to resolve that conflict. It might be going to the week before, but there's an FMP luncheon that week, and I don't know if that's a student luncheon or a teacher luncheon, so I have to hear from Dolores Fisher on that. So I'll be posting in the conference as soon as I know what's gonna happen in April. So there'll be some changes there. Um, but I think that's all I need to do as far as uh, announcements. I just want to turn it over to Ann. And oh, I do have to tell you that Ann is a spotlight speaker at the Illinois Computing Educators Conference at the end of this month. And when I saw that she was doing that, that's when I twisted her arm and said, How would you like to give us a little taste of what that session is going to be like? So this is like an eight hour workshop down, down to an hour something <laughs> at ICE. And now we're going to give her 30 minutes for just like the cliff notes of this. So this is like the best of what is going to come if you go to her session. So I take it away, Ann. Thank you. Hi. First of all, I want to thank Charlene for kind of giving me a kick in the butt. I'm a notorious procrastinator, and the you know conference isn't for another week, so my stuff wasn't done until she asked me to do this. Um, but because I am like that, I created a wiki uh, pretty much last night. So it is not on your handout. Um, if you want to write it down, it is a work in progress. So please bear with me. It is Truger Tech Talk. That wikispaces.com. And when we pass up the handouts, you have two Oh, I thought they already got there. No, they're on the end of the table. <laughs> and then you can tell them right away about their bright idea site. Yep. You want to just pass? There's three. 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 Two sets. Two handouts. sets. Okay. You can take it. I didn't realize they didn't pick them up. <laughs> they're just kind of hanging down there at the end. Does everybody get one? Because we have some more on the extra tables there. Okay, so trugertechtalk.wikispaces.com. And it's not all fleshed out yet, but if you go to the UDL resources section, there's a little bit about universal design for learning. Universal design for learning is a research-based framework for designing curriculum. It takes its roots from the um, architectural movement of universal design, which is how we ended up with the wonderful curb cuts that we have and all the great elevators and the widened aisles in the stores. Um, they looked at that and they realized that as they made everything accessible to everyone, not just to those people in wheelchairs. People who weren't in the wheelchairs were using those curb cuts. People who were pushing strollers, people who were riding bicycles or pulling wagons. And they started to look at um, the curriculum as well. And what they're trying, their, their idea is that universal design for learning means that every student has access to the general curriculum. You're not making a modified curriculum. You're simply opening up access to what already exists. And a great way to do that is to make your, to take your um, textbooks and things like that and scan them and make them into electronic format because electronic format allows for the most um, modifications uh, to make it universally accessible to everybody. The other thing that I found out when I started doing research on the universal design for learning is that it really takes all of your best practices in, in instruction that we've gone through throughout the years. You know, the cooperative learning groups, um, having multiple means of uh, presenting material, 
um, allowing students to express themselves with multiple means. And after teaching here at Stevenson, I know that you guys are, are really good about, you know, some kids will turn in a report, some will make a presentation, some will do a podcast, and you, you know, you utilize their strengths. Um, but not everybody does. So that's a big part of the universal design for learning, is the multiple means of expression, multiple means of um, expression, and multiple means of representation. So basically, a lot of what you guys do is wrapped into universal design, but nobody's ever called it that before. But what we want to make sure is that the kids who can really read and grasp the material in the book, as well as the kids who can't read that book, still have access to that book and to that um, curriculum without you having to go and read it to them or get a team member to read it to them. So there's a lot of ways that you can accomplish that. The other point is that um, there is a difference between the universal design for learning and assistive technology. Assistive technology focuses on one student and giving them access to the curriculum, whereas the universal design for learning focuses on all students. If you think about like a pyramid, you want all of your kids to have access to the curriculum, not just those few at the top that are the straight A plus students that get it all the time. Okay? Um, in your handouts here, CAST is the organization that has come up with um, pretty much this whole theory. It's the Center for Applied Special Technologies. And you have several handouts here um, explaining universal design straight from their website. And then there's also a link to this book because um, CAST practices what they preach. They have a multimedia version of this book. You can purchase a hard copy of the book and you can have the book read to you from the site. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can access the material. There are also several um, lesson plan builder ideas, so you can put your lesson plans in and they'll help you how to make them more universally accessible. So there's a lot, a lot of resources on that um, website. At the bottom of my wiki is a link to CAST, so this is the link to CAST. There's an article about universal design for learning, which is a very simple to read article, very straightforward. There's the link directly to the online book, and then there's a link to UDL Tech Toolkit. This UDL Tech Toolkit is a wiki space that was created by Karen Janowski. Karen Janowski is an assistive technology specialist out on the East Coast, and she does amazing things. It says access denied because there's a Globster thing on here, but I can at least show you the side here. One of the things that I found, there are so many different tools that you can download for your computer to help accessibility. A lot of them, however, not all, but a lot of them are PC-based. So this would be a great resource to send parents to who are looking for ideas of different ways to do things with their kids. There's free text-to-speech tools, graphic organizers, study skills, literacy, writing tools, collaborative tools. I mean, there's just so many different tools, which you can't see because they're off the side of them. Um, so in each one of these, there's more and more tools. Each page leads to more tools. But a lot of the tools are PC-based. We are very lucky because we have the OS X interface. And before I get into that, there's a sheet here on your um, tables. It's called Bright Ideas. This is something that I've started doing in all my professional developments. When I was doing professional development, I'd watch teachers taking notes and notes and notes and notes. And then they can never find that one piece of information they didn't want to forget. So what this does is just let you kind of put the important things into a box. So like if I give a key command that you don't necessarily know, that might be a bright idea you want to write down. So it's just a way to organize your thoughts and notes. Okay, so moving on. This is the part of um, my presentation that normally is a two hour workshop that I'm condensing into less than 30 minutes. Um, so I'm going to go kind of quickly, but please don't hesitate to raise your hand if you have any questions. The Mac OS system has a whole bunch of universal access already built into the system preferences. Now the universal access um, preferences are in the universal access section of your preferences, but there are also some in speech and there are also some in keyboard and mouse. Okay, So it's not always clear cut where you're going to find everything. First thing we're going to go into is universal access. And at the top it says, when using this computer, I would like assistance with. And that's how you can kind of figure out what you need to um, change. If you need assistance with seeing, one of the things you can turn on is voiceover. 
voiceover in itself could be probably a half day to full day workshop because there are so many pieces to voiceover. I'm going to show it to you very simpl simply, but understand that there's a lot of things that can be done with it and a lot of tweaking. Um, I'm going to turn it on for a minute because it gets a little annoying if it's on too long. Welcome to Macintosh. But if you're somebody Voice who needs running. this information, it's invaluable. Window, universal access, toolbar. System preferences, edit, menu, view, menu. Okay, so window, it reads menu, your help, toolbars menu. and it can read the window, window names. Menu, toolbar. Turn this off. But if you open your voiceover utility, and this is all these sections have to do with the voiceover utility. Now, if you have a child who has um, vision issues, if you have a student with vision issues, and you have vision, vision itinerant, there's actually a section where it turns pretty much all the text into Braille, and you plug in um, an assistive tech device that turns it into Braille for the kids to be able to read what's on the computer. So there's a lot of really neat things built right in. Um, under verbosity, this is how, like, what are you going to do when, when it's speaking? Are they going to read the numbers as words? Um, do you want them to speak the link? Uh, first three times for repeated punctuation. So there's all these different settings that you can go into. And under speech, there's a pronunciation section. So when you come to different things when you're reading them, like for instance, when you come to a smiley icon there, it'll say smiley. Okay, so there's a bunch of different things that you can do with this. So this is the voiceover utility. Now the second one that I use all the time is the Zoom. And the Zoom is a great tool. It's Option Command 8 to turn it on. Option Command 8, you'll watch, it'll go from off to on. And then Option Command, and then it says the equal sign. I use the plus sign because that tells me that I'm zooming in and things are getting bigger. So now I can zoom in anywhere on my page. I can zoom out using the minus. It's the Option Command minus. And some important things about this in the options. If you set a maximum zoom, and this is something that if you have a student who has visual issues, if you set all of their preferences the way they need to be in their profile, then when they log in again, it'll already be set. You don't have to keep changing it. But this is one of the things that drove me nuts with um, the zoom until I figured it out. If you have a maximum zoom set and you go to zoom in, it goes all the way to that point. Now for me, I'm a bit of a control freak. I like to control how far I'm going in and out, which is why I keep mine set at just the minimum. So I control it depending on how many times I click the button. The other thing that's important is I like only when the pointer reaches an edge, because if I go continuously with the pointer, this is what happens. Every time the cursor moves, it moves everywhere. So if you're using, somebody said they use the trackpad to zoom in. If you're using that and you're getting this problem, you can get rid of that by going only when the pointer reaches the edge. Okay? So that's zooming in and zooming out. Simple enough? Okay, the next one is the display, and I'm sure plenty of people have seen this on their computers. Okay? Kids think it's kind of cool. They're really good at doing the key commands, and, and, and we maybe have to go into system preferences to turn it off and fix it. But the key command is Control, Option, Command, and the number 8. Control, Option, Command, and the number 8. And there are students that this will be beneficial for. You know, there are students that will have visual issues that will be able to focus better and understand what they're reading better with the different contrast. The other thing you can change is enhancing the actual contrast with the slider. Okay. That's, that's it for seeing. Now we're going to go into hearing. Oh, I forgot. At the bottom down here, I always keep this checked, enable for assistive devices, because what that means is if somebody brings in an assistive device and plugs it in, it gives access to that device to the system preferences. So I just keep it checked because it doesn't affect anything one way or the other unless something's plugged in. And then this one right here, you won't have yet, um, unless you're on 10.5, this is a leopard thing. And what it does is it puts your universal status up in your menu bar. So now it'll tell me exactly what's turned on and what's turned off. 
and it's just a quicker way to get to my access preferences. Now, if you have someone who can't hear, you've got the flashing screen every time there's an alert. If I was to turn this on and forget about it, then every time there's an alert, my screen would flash. So I'm not going to turn that on right now. But just so you can see, that's how it works. You can also adjust your volume here. In the keyboard, there are a couple of different places to be. Sticky keys and slow keys. And there's a couple of reasons for these. Let me open up a document here. OK, so we know that if we lay on a keyboard, it's going to start going, wait a second, I did the wrong thing. Bye. I'm doing sticky keys first. Sticky keys is for if somebody can't get their fingers to do like um, combo key commands. So for instance, to do a shift to get a capital letter, if the sticky keys is turned on, makes that wonderful little noise so I know it's turned on. And if I hit the shift key, see that arrow up there? That tells me the shift key is stuck in the position, and now when I hit the letter, it's going to be capitalized. Okay. Another example would be if I wanted to save this document, I could hit the command key, gives me this symbol, and then hit the S, and it would go to save. Okay. Like my BlackBerry, like my BlackBerry keyboard. Yes. Yes. These are sticky keys, is what this is called. Turn off sticky keys. You can also, um, if you have this checked, and sometimes this is checked and kids do this, um, if you press your shift key five times, it turns on and off your sticky keys. Okay? That caused me a problem when I was playing a video game that I had to keep hitting the shift key and it kept turning that on and I didn't know what was going on. Okay, and then we've got, um, for difficulties, with kids with repeated keystrokes to slow down the keys. So if I lay on a key, it comes up pretty quickly. If I turn on slow keys, you know what, I didn't change the substance as I did. Okay. So I'm holding the key down and it's just taking longer. So why would that be important? If you have a child who doesn't have very good muscle control and, or somebody who lays on the keyboard, then they're going to only get one letter at a time. Okay, So that's another really a, a nice little tool. But another one that you don't want to leave turned on because when you go to type, you're like, what is it typing? So luckily, I leave all those sounds on. And by leaving those sounds on, I know when something's turned on and off. But after I do a workshop like this, a lot of times I go back and I'm opening something and I'm doing something and I'm like, what is the problem? And then I realize I have something turned on in my universal access. Okay, if we go to mouse and trackpad, I am not going to turn this on because this crashed me last time um, to the point where I had to do a total restart. And in a 30 minute session, that's no good. <laughs> um, the mouse keys, if you turn it on, then instead of using your mouse, you would actually use um, key, key commands. Um, so you and you can set it to the different key commands. A lot of times it goes with the arrows. Um, you can also set it to ignore trackpad. So if they hit the trackpad, it won't affect it. And uh, I'm not going to do that right now, as I said. But just so you know, that's one of the things that can be done. The other thing that's really nice is for those of you who uh, need to be able to see in the back where the cursor is, you can increase the size of your cursor. I know a lot of people that keep their cursor right about here because they can't see the cursor when it's this small. Okay? And you don't even realize how small it is until you see it larger, do you? Um, the one thing I will warn you about this, though, especially if you're using an interactive whiteboard, if you have a large size cursor, you have to remember that even though it's large visually, it's still tiny and it still only has that small pinpoint to, um, to click on something. You'll think you're right on it but you're not because the tip isn't right on it. So that's just a little word of advice because I always end up having to turn it off when I'm using my interactive board. Okay, so that's the, those are the ones that are in the universal access piece. Now we're going to go to the keyboard and mouse piece. And this is another place where um, if kids have played with it, you'll know um, because key repeat rate, okay? So if my key repeat rate is set to fast and I hit a letter, 
it's going to keep going quickly. If I slow it down. That one's not working so well. Interesting. Something's not working on that one. Um, there's also the delay until repeat. So how long is it going to delay before it'll repeat the letter? So that's kind of like the, um, uh, the, not the sticky keys, but the other one that was on there. I can't think. The sticky keys and the uh, slow, keys. Slow, keys. slow keys. That's it. Thank you. That slow keys. Point. And then here's your list of all your keyboard shortcuts. So if you're ever looking for those shortcuts that everybody seems to know but you, here they are. Okay, so those are your keyboard shortcuts. What time do we have to? You have uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. See, we got much faster this time. Okay, going into speech, going to text-to-speech. This is one of probably the most important tools, in my opinion, is text-to-speech. Now, on the PC side, there's all sorts of programs you can download. I know Microsoft Word has a text-to-speech feature. Um, there are a few that you can download for the Mac. But you don't need to, because if you turn on text to speech and you set a key command, which I set my key command to option S. And the reason I do that, I know a lot of people who do command S, but then they lose their save command. And for me, I use that religiously. So I have option S, option to speak. That's how I think about it. And I'm going to go ahead to a website. This will work in your email. This will work on something that's typed. So if you scan a chapter of a book, this will work on that. Where will the National Institute be this summer? On a cruise to Mexico? In Boston? In Monte Rai? Washington, D.C.? Or will it be in Las Vegas? That's a user to and only you can decide. Visit the deadlogs right now to cast your vote and help determine where it will be held. Okay, so what I thought was really cool about that, did everybody hear Cusitin? Yeah. That's because it's spelled wrong on the website. Oh. oh. Okay, so think about the power of their own proofing, listening to their own papers that they've written. I bet they could find some of those errors that you just can't understand why they don't see them when they're on the paper. So there's there's some really good Can stuff. Can you zoom in and show us that? Yeah. There, now I see. Right there. Oops. Cusitin. Cusitin. <laughs> I'm gonna have to rib Lance about that. <laughs> Okay, so that is um, text-to-speech, and you can also, as we looked at before, if we go into our preferences on that, we can um, go into our voiceover preferences, which takes us back to universal access, and back to voiceover, and back to pronunciation. This is where you set how it's going to sound or what it's going to say. So, like, if it sees... If it sees uh, GIF, instead of saying GIF, it's going to pronounce it GIF, because that, that's how it's typed. <coughs> or GUI, it's going to pronounce it GUI instead of GUI. Okay, so you can set it to pronounce things different ways. Just like if, if it says, you know, if there's a wink emoticon, it's going to say wink when it reads it. Okay. The best voice in Leopard is uh, Alex. However, you guys have 10-4. And what voice did you say? Did you Victoria. say Victoria? Yeah. Victoria. Vicky or Victoria? Victoria, usually. Nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. So that's Victoria. And what was the other one? Vicky, right above that. Vicky. Nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Okay, now you see why I like Alex. <laughs> but you can kind of creeping me out a little bit. Nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Yeah, yeah. I can't do that, pal. <laughs> 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 I can't do that, pal. <laughs> 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 <
<laughs> but you can change the rate and pitch there too. Yes. Yes, you can change change how fast that they're going to read and the pitch that they're going to read at. There's a lot of things that you can change right there. So with the how is in a Word document like something that you've typed? Can you just highlight that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The doors, huh? Open the doors. Okay, so now we're going to go into speech. And we've looked at text to speech, which is pretty simple. And now we're going to look at something called speech recognition. And I'm going to turn on speakable items, and we're going to see how well this works. But for it to work, everybody has to be quiet because it needs to hear my voice. What time is it? It's 1.19. What day is it? Didn't like that. What day is it? What day is it? You have to train it, and I've been trying to train it all day, and it's not listening very well. <laughs> what day is it? It's Friday, February 13th. <gasps> Should I try the one that hasn't worked yet? Tell me a joke. Tell me a joke. It doesn't like to tell me jokes. Tell me a joke. Close window. Close window. Close Firefox. Switching to Firefox. Quit Firefox. Quit pages. Quit pages. Switching to pages. Quit pages. Switching to pages. Close window. Okay. You have to train this. And here, this is where you come in to train it. You calibrate your microphone. And when I did this originally, I used a headphone with a mic. And it trains a lot better that way. Because there's a lot of ambient noises. But you'll see that as I say the phrases, they'll flash. What time is it? Quit this application. Open a document. Show me what to say. Make this page speakable. Move page down. Hide this application. Switch to Finder. Okay, so I'm training it to recognize my voice. If Charlene came over and said the same things, depending on the, the tone she used, it may or may not listen to her. <laughs> okay? So there's also a way to train it um, where you can say computer instead of having to push a key, uh, key on the keyboard. You can say computer, quit this application. Star Trek. It, it's kind of cool. Do you want to show um, them all the commands, all the commands? Yeah, I was going to show them the commands. These are the different commands um, under application switching these are the commands that it recognizes on how to um, open things how to quit things how to go from one app to another these are speakable items things that you can say that it will do um, and let's see which one you can also like I had it yesterday I was saying I chat Valdana it opened my iChat and it brought up the thing and it had a little blurb to Valdonin for me to type into. So I was able to kind of multitask more than normal <laughs> using that. Um, so, but this obviously could be a very powerful tool for somebody who can't do the keyboard or who can't do the mouse. Um, so the other thing, the one thing that I want you to walk away with um, from this, do you want, do you want to tell your joke, your story before I do this? I will. Yeah. Okay. She has a story. I have a story. <laughs> I know you're shocked, but she has a story. <laughs> well, it's always nice to remember stories. When we first went to OS 10 about five years ago, I think, or whenever yeah. OS 10 first came out, and we spent some considerable time in the summer doing a train the trainer model, similar to what we've done for first classes. So that was our first train the trainer model. And March Plank was a German teacher at the time. Those of you that have been here for a while remember Marge. And I believe she was one of our trainers. And we discovered the different things that you can do in OS 10, and we found universal access. When we saw the command list of all the things that were in there, we saw the one that said, tell me a joke. And so we started playing with the tell me a joke. And it, just like Ann said, you have to have the right ambient noise. You have a headset. It works much better. Well, the humor in there, it, when you say that and it recognizes your voice, it goes knock, knock. Then you say, who's there? And then it gives you a phrase and twig. you what is it? It was twig last night. Twig, twig who? Twig a tweet. 
<laughs> and so the humor is very much uh, geared to like the junior high level. So Marge went home that night and spent two hours talking to her computer, tell me a joke, knock knock, who's there? And her husband thought she was absolutely nuts. And she wrote down all of the knock knock jokes and the answers and typed them all up and shared them with me. So I do have the complete list of like 50 jokes or 30 jokes that are in the computer. If you're really interested and want to know and play the humor game, but I would invite you to have a little bit of fun and just talk to your computer sometime, you know, when you have nothing else to do. But just to lighten up the mood a little bit and, and go in for the jokes because it's really a lot of fun. So that's my story about the <laughs> yeah, text to speech. That the knock knock joke was originally told in the play Macbeth by William Shakespeare. I didn't know that. Yeah. Really? Wow. It comes from the Porter's speech in Knock Knock, who was there? Boy, those are old jokes. <laughs> 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 now we have to add to the story. One of the things that I want you to remember, which I think is really important, is that so often it, it's like we give this gift to people who have a disability. You know, oh, he can't read, I'm going to show him text to speech. You know, then he'll be able to read. But, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, is that A-plus student who can sit there and read that book without any effort whatsoever might learn even faster if they were hearing it. So, you know, remember that this is to access all the curriculum for everyone. And, um, you know, give those options to other people, too. I mean, you're not going to make them lazy just by giving them the right tools um, to access the curriculum because they're still getting that curriculum knowledge. And just to bring up a website again, I just want to show the services in that's the one piece, any web page. But Sorry, one thing, I if you're not going to quit, hmm? I told it to quit right. by But <laughs> if you're not going into system preferences and you don't want to set that special key to speak text, and what's nice about that is because you can select a paragraph and have it just read that paragraph. But if, on anything that's in Mac OS 10, so we'll just choose Firefox as an option, <coughs> under the application menu, you see like where it says Firefox, you see something called services. And when you go down to services, there's always a speech button there or a speech option. And so where it says start speaking text and stop speaking text, you could highlight things that way and just go to services and start there and services and stop. So it's not the keyboard shortcut. <coughs> if you forget, where was that system preference? Can you, it didn't work? Mm -hmm. It works in Safari. I think it has to be yeah. an Apple product. It has to be in Safari. I'm going to say because I've never used Safari. it. Safari. 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 Has. Safari yeah. has the services. And Word has a speech toolbar yes. that's just under speak speak items. Do you know where that one is? I, I believe it's under speak yeah, items. Yeah, so you can turn it on in different programs, but if it's an Apple product, like Apple Mail, it would work in in Safari, it's under services. So that's another place you can look. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Ben, for joining us today. Thank you all for coming. If anybody has any questions, I'm here. So yeah, do do take a time to look at that UDL website. There are some really interesting things there that's good for all learners. So thank you very much. Yeah, they have a great technical difficulties. That's right. Without that, they're much quicker.